So the next person to get us thinking about these big questions and um, that world of where we could be thinking about networks is see where she is. So Shoma Shaha should be coming up to our little stage here. And while she's doing that, let me tell you just a little bit about her background. <clears throat> All right, she's on her way, great. So Shomava uh, has dedicated her career to improving health, well-being, and equity through the development of thriving people, organizations, and communities. She has worked as a primary care internist, so she's trained as a physician, and has also worked as a pediatrician in the safety net and as a global public health practitioner, all of that over um, at least 20 years. She's currently the founder and executive lead of well-being and equity in the world. We call it we in the world. And then she's also the executive lead of the well-being in the, way, in, in the nation, the WIN network. And these uh, networks together work to advance intergenerational well-being and equity. She serves as faculty at the Harvard Medical School, the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, and the Governance Institute. And we're just really excited to have Shomava here with us today to share her thoughts. So Shomava, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Are you all able to hear me? So we can hear you well. Perfect. Uh, it is such a privilege to be with all of you today. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen, but as I begin, begin to do that, I want to reflect on a, a few of the comments that um, that, that Charles shared uh, today. Are you all able to see uh, see my screen and uh, the the um, presentation? Perfect. So I, I just wanted to reflect on some of um, Charles's comments because I found them to be so striking uh, and reflective of my experience as uh, initially leading, um, well, uh, leading 100 million healthier lives uh, and then uh, watching the well-being of the nation network emerge from that. And, you know, this understanding that the thing that we always said uh, in 100 million and in WIN is that it's it's not about one uh, ring or one network to rule them all. It's about what it means to be in each other's networks. That spread happens at the speed of trust uh, and that it's really through our unprecedented collaboration. It's about the support we give each other that we begin to truly create a, a, a difference in the world uh, and create the space where um, unprecedented solutions can emerge from the most unlikely places, get spread and scaled, and give all of us an insight uh, about what, what we do. So well-being and equity in the world grew out of this massive learning in 100 million about oh, with over 1,850 organizations and over 500 million networks. I see so many people here today who are in some way connected to the network and where we were part of your networks. Um, and exist to take some of the lessons that were learned about creating relationships and systems change, about the systems that were creating trapped and untapped potential and perpetuating inequities today, as well as the ways in which relationships and connections could create unprecedented solutions that could achieve 50% or better outcomes so that we could begin to say, can we take this learning and use this to create the system as it needs to be to make those uh, outcomes sustainable and scaled, even as we change the underlying systems that are creating the poor, uh, that are perpetuating poor outcomes. And so it's relationships and systems change sets at the heart of what we do. And I'm going to frame a little bit of this to really go into, in practical terms, what has this meant for us uh, as we as a network and as we as an organization that supports networks have been thinking and leaning into this moment of coronavirus that has brought all of us together uh, in, in each other's networks and in a shared experience. So as we think about that, um, the, the four things that we often say we do in the we in the world is develop and scale frameworks, not just ours, but other people's too, that, that change the way we think and act to create well-being and equity. The second is we help change makers on the ground to actually apply those in real life in places like 
Texas and Delaware and Rhode Island and Guyana and the Gambia to create transformative change. The third is we build strategic networks that are capable of changing the system. And fourth, we build a community of accompaniers who are, are thinking together, learning together, reflecting together. And that's meant that we have been part of many of your networks and have often come together as part of the Wellbeing in the Nation Network. I'm going to give you a, some simple examples of what this could look like in real life. In terms of uh, thinking about health equity and how we create health equity, one thing we often say is that you have to think in terms of uh, the interconnected uh, um, interconnectedness between people, places, and systems driving inequity. And I'm just going to use that as a through line to think about how we've been um, building the we uh, in we in the world, uh, it, but which is not about a group of people that are tightly connected or hired by us, but the larger we uh, of who we collectively are that can see and understand the interconnection of what's happening in this moment of corona, of, of the, what we call the corona crisis. And in, in the context of this, you know, what are the, our opportunities to actually form new connections, um, new partnerships, new insights that help us see and understand the legacies that got us here, how those are showing up in the world today, and what it means for us to be a shared movement for change to address those legacies. Now, equity is the price of admission in uh, in uh, we at We in the World and the WID Network and, and in 100 Million Lives. So you won't be surprised that I'll be talking a little bit about equities and how those are inequities and how those are showing up. We know that it, that COVID is something that affects all of us. And yet what we see is in primarily uh, black counties uh, compared with others that, that, black, uh, that black Latinx and uh, not tribal communities have been most affected. And those have not been accidental. We see that, that they've been affected not just by deaths and COVID, but by societal factors such as unemployment. If your uh, income is less than, um, $40,000 uh, or even less than $90,000, you're almost twice as likely to actually end up being in a, a position where you've lost a job. And when you look at maps of uh, COVID deaths and COVID cases, especially, and maps of uh, where frontline workers live and long-term social vulnerability, you begin to see the same patterns. And this won't be news to most of you on this call, but it's, it's when we begin to see the residential segregation that's been our legacy for so many years that leads some people to be only able to live in particular places that don't have the wealth they need, uh, not just individually, but where the places don't have the wealth they need to create long-term outcomes. I think one of the things that this moment offers us is an opportunity to begin to help people ask questions. And so one of the things we've really been learning to do in our work in this moment is to build a broader we by, by asking questions, by holding dialogues that invite people um, to look at things like these maps uh, and look at the data around the people, places, and systems in some simple ways and begin to engage in conversations that ask who has to work uh, who has to work? What protection do they have? Um, can they afford to be quarantined? Who can't work or has reduced work? What are the conditions of work? How much wealth do they have? And what benefits do they have? And in doing that, it begins to connect the dots between the, the mental health, between economic well-being and, and uh, health outcomes from COVID. And then as we get deeper, we get into things like how we got here. Why is it that some people live in some of these places and other people don't? What's our legacy of racism and how is that showing up today in our current day moment uh, in terms of what people feel, you know, for instance, and how people do or don't feel like they can cover their faces with bandanas? or not? How is that leading to more isolation? Uh, how is What are people's perception of who's clean and unclean, who's safe or unsafe, and how is that impacting uh, basic needs for health and safety, along with the basic um, mechanisms and agency people have through jobs and, other, and income to be able to have control over their health and safety? 
if you are living in tribal lands or in the border uh, of Texas and you don't have access to clean water at the level that your community had 282 cases of cholera, it's really hard to ask people to wash their hands. If you can't afford to say no to going in to a, a frontline job, an essential worker job where you don't have adequate PPE, but you can't afford to lose that job, it's very difficult to say no. Uh, and if you can't afford to live in a home where you have don't have so many, where you don't have multiple people sharing a room and no means for social distancing, uh, it really isn't an option to say, stay home and socially distance. And I think until we can begin to understand that these things that there's this common experience of COVID and yet, there are some things that are deeply different in our experiences. Until we can begin to have brave conversations about that, it's difficult to know how to create change. But the opportunity of this moment to have those conversations and to actually have that translate to how people are seeing that touches the life of someone that they might see in their communities or that they might see in uh, the, the clinical care system, or they might see in social services or in, in, the, in, in who, somebody who's incarcerated, giving people real-time ways of making that real and having to have dialogues in that is something that we found powerfully uh, to be uh, a creator of we, of, of moving hundreds of people across states to begin to take action. And I think the other thing we have to be able to do to create the we is not help have people feel overwhelmed by the we. So the other thing we've learned is the ability to like show the picture, ask the questions, translate it to what that means for the life of someone who is experiencing inequity, and then help people to see the system view that requires the broader we to come together to change that system together. And this uh, this is a very simple um, slide from uh, a webinar we did uh, last week in Rhode Island, where we launched a, a net, they've net, a launched a network across the state to advance health equity in the time of Corona, which helps people do risk stratification not only in terms of you know what a payer might give in terms of data, but also in terms of places by social vulnerability and inequities in the context of COVID, and giving people simple real time tools to take a broad concept, begin to break it down into what could be actionable and to be able to look at the underlying policies and systems. But 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 to begin that from a place of connection with people with lived experience is something that we've learned is powerfully important in this context. A second thing that we've learned is that, you know, we can to tell people things all we want, but it's when people come into proximity, it's when people can see the bigger picture that they begin to take action. And so one of the things we've been able to do in this time is to use things like data in a catalytic way to create the we. Um, some simple questions uh, that are people reported measures between in, that were um, used in Delaware, for instance, around well-being, around hopefulness or, or hopelessness, financial security and loneliness uh, to be ascertained with no more than five questions and which gives people branch points of what they can do and why, uh, for instance, hopelessness is related to something they really care deeply about in the state, debts of despair, which have been on the rise and how that relates to financial security. Again, something that can be understood with a simple question. It helps people to get in proximity, to get into different conversations with the people that they may be coming into contact with and to begin to build that broader we that includes the voice of lived experience of the person with inequity, as well as immediately supports that person with lived experience to be able to access the resources they really need, not just the resources we might have prioritized in our in our questions. And to be able to make it okay in this moment, to give simple tools to measure things like well-being and hope and financial security and loneliness, uh, it, those are powerful ways that people, as they engage in those conversations, begin to get into an aha. I'm going to and um, this piece, part, part of uh, my conversation with you with just this idea of what it means, um, say that you get lots of people moving in um, Rhode Island and Texas and Guyana and Washington and Wisconsin and other places and hundreds of communities across the country. What does it mean to use this moment to come together as a strategic network to advance intergenerational change? This is a legacy moment. 
in, in our mind. This is a moment where people are seeing the world differently and thinking about it differently and are, are willing to, to, to see change. We're seeing policies passed around paid family leave and uh, benefits that act, um, bring some direct resources to those um, who, who are most affected by inequities and a readiness to do that in a way that wasn't there before. So what does it mean for us to come together across our networks in a strategic way to understand the legacies that got us here, but also to use this legacy mean, legacy making moment to build the legacies we want our children and grandchildren to grow into. And that requires a massive we of we's. It's not um, one network that's going to do it. And one of the things that we've learned to do is to really create spaces where many can join in and lead. The Wellbeing of the Nation Network is set up as a ne network of cooperatives that are interconnected, that as um, different groups are able to, are, in fact, this is each cooperative is led by different organizations that are in relationship to one another. Different groups can lead in different places. All of them share a, a common understanding of what it means to prioritize equity and belonging and civic muscle and the, and the interconnection between all the vital conditions that are needed to sustain uh, well-being. And in this moment, some of what we've learned to do is to begin to actually write and tell stories and lift up poetry and host dialogues that help people transform our understanding of why people are poor, of why people might be suffering from uh, coronavirus, of why, what policies and systems could lead to real change. Um, there are things that we've learned to do that are about uplifting the heart, about building our common connection with one another, and about within partnership with and supporting groups like the Weaving Communities, for instance, hosting conversations, thousands, tens of thousands of dialogues across the country about what it means to come together across differences. And with that coming together, that larger we of who we, who everyone is, begin to change our, our understanding of how we got here and where we wanna go. And I'll, as I ended this reflection, what it's brought us to today as we've been in conversation with groups across uh, Black and Latinx and tribal and urban and rural <laughs> and communities all across the country is that if we need to do this, we need to begin to think about our legacies for living together and come together, together in shared stewardship to transform what are legacies of trauma and exclusion that are leading to where we are into legacies of dignity and inclusion. That we need to come together to not only say that uh, we need to have an urgent response to address adversity and uh, and the needs that are today, but to chart a path for resilience and also transformation in those underlying legacies. And if we're going to do that, to do that in a way that supports people to thrive, we need to fundamentally be about creating relationship and shared stewardship. And that is what it means ultimately to me to build a we all the way from the the, the, from the neighborhood table, the kitchen table, uh, all the way to the policy table. My key, our key strategies we're learning so far, help people connect the dots between health and the vital conditions everyone needs, like, like, war, like meaningful work and wealth and housing and transportation, help organizations and communities apply an equity lens to their response in a way that doesn't just support a response now, but builds a path toward longer term system transformation. And finally, make it practical, meaningful, and actionable and invite people to join you. None of us are gonna change the world alone. It's only together that we can do it. Thank you.